Hello, I'm Valerie Jackson, and this evening I'm going between the lines with one of America's leading journalists, Juan Williams. He's the author of the nonfiction bestseller, Eyes on the Prize, America's Civil Rights Years, 1954 to 1965, the companion volume to the critically acclaimed television series. Williams was White House correspondent for the Washington Post and has been a regular panelist on Special Report with Britt Hume and Fox News Sunday with Chris Wallace. He received an Emmy Award for television documentary he received an Emmy Award for television documentary writing, and he has frequently served as co-host on CNN's Crossfire. Perhaps it's his degree in philosophy that causes him to ponder the culture of failure, as he describes it, in the African-American community. His most recent book is Enough, The Phony Leaders, Dead End Movements, and Culture of Failure That Are Undermining Black America and what we can do about it. Welcome, Juan, and thank you for allowing us to go between the lines with you this evening. Val, it's my pleasure to be with you. Well, let's see. Eyes on the Prize received multiple Emmys, a George Foster Peabody Award, and numerous other awards. It became one of the most watched and talked about public television series in history. Your companion book has been hailed as the definitive, comprehensive history of the early civil rights years. But before we talk about that, tell us a little bit about Henry Hampton, the executive producer, the man whose vision gave us the faces and places of those who were the real backbone of the movement. You know, Henry is such a fascinating character to me. It's almost as if you were writing a novel, you would create Henry Hampton. Uh, his dad was a surgeon in St. Louis, and Henry was kind of the black sheep of the family because he didn't go to medical school. Uh, Henry wanted to go off and explore the arts and the world of literature, and uh, went off and really was kind of hanging out, and then got interested in the Unitarian Church, uh, and was a spokesman for the Unitarian Church in Boston when a minister by the name of Jim Reeb, a white man, was killed in Selma, hit in the head, uh, in the process of leaving a restaurant, working with civil rights workers who were trying to assert the right to vote. Henry went down south uh, as a spokesman for the Unitarian Church and uh, saw the amazing panorama of the movement, the passion, the sacrifices being made, the tension between good and bad. And he thought, you know, I, one day I would love to make a movie about the civil rights movement. Came back to Boston you know, uh, continued his work, started to make small documentaries for the Navy, other government agencies, wherever he could get some work. But he always had that dream in the back of his mind. That dream one day becomes eyes on the prize. He actually did cross the Pettus Bridge in, in, in Selma, right? Uh, no, he no? was, he, as I said, came after Jim Reeb was killed. And then oh, okay. I'm sure he walked across the bridge, but he wasn't there at that moment I when see. John Lewis uh, is famously uh, hit in the head. Mm -hmm. Well, it's been about 20 years now since it was last aired. What stands out still in your mind today as those things that were most, uh, that phased you the most? Well, you know, sometimes it's things outside the lines, Val. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when I was talking to Henry about this project, Henry told me, he said, you know, ABC is interested in this. He says, but I turned them down. And I was like, but Henry, I thought you were struggling for money. Why would you turn? He says, well, he says, let me tell you a story. And he says to me, you know, they, 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 they had such success with Roots and Alex Haley. And when they heard about the idea of the civil rights movement, they said to me, that's great. Why don't we have, and here they, they talked about various singers uh, playing Martin Luther King Jr. Mm -hmm. as a singer, a jazz singer or a gospel singer in a kind of musical and he said, it was very attractive, but no, <laughs> you know, I'm not going to do it. And that's when he goes on his struggle to raise money, to get the money, the funding together to tell this story. And to me, you know, uh, the idea of, you know, some singer playing Martin Luther King, of the whole thing being so commercialized, I think would have stolen the spirit before Eyes on the Prize was ever put together. It would not be the historic document that we know today. Uh, you know, you know the power of the film. 
the documentary as it's going to be rebroadcast. But, you know, the book, Eyes on the Prize, hasn't been out of print in the 20 years. Mm -hmm. It's now, there are now more than 250,000 copies circulating. And to my mind, it is all testimony to the power of Henry's vision to say, you know what, this is beyond, you know, any kind of song and dance. This is important history that too often goes unattended and needs to be told. Is that why after 20 years we're putting it back on the air? I think without a doubt, you know, you heard earlier some discussion about young people, and I'm so hopeful that parents will grab the young man or young woman, maybe even not so young anymore, and say, hey, let's sit down for a second. I'd like you to watch this with yeah. me. Yeah. I think it's telling, and uh, it's inspiring in terms of the capacity of individuals to make a difference in their time. You see people standing tall, and sometimes they're very, what you and I might say, oh, well, it's a housewife. You know, young man's a teacher, older man's a policeman, somebody is a barber. But you know what? There came a moment when something happened for them. There was some moment when insight led to action and a sense of new vision about what was possible in America. And they put themselves out, not for greater glory, not for sort of self-aggrandization or wealth, but they put themselves out for principle. I just don't think there's anything greater in American life, in our democracy, than people who stand for principle, and that's what's celebrated in Eyes on the Prize. And you think about it for a second, Valerie, the nobility of the struggle is that it goes across racial lines, across class lines, across lines of religion. It's an appeal to conscience in the name of America being a place where there's a level playing field for people, equality of opportunity. That's the grandeur of the civil rights movement, and that's what's reflected in Eyes on the Prize. Now, in your book, Eyes on the Prize, there are some things in there that we might not be able to glean from the movie. And one, one of the interesting things that I ran across today, again, was, was the origin of the name Jim Crow. Share that with us. Because, well, dance well, you know, Jim Crow, you know. This is, this, to me, so much of this has to do with the notion of putting down black people. If you go back to the Reconstruction era, of course, after the Civil War, after emancipation, you see black people being given opportunity as never before, obviously. But there was a reaction in terms of the white body politics, especially in the South, and a reaction that said we want to recoup or reclaim the kind of white supremacist hierarchy that had been in place. And part of that effort involved Jim Crow. Involved but, but that name, Jim Crow, that's what I'm... Well, I, where did that name, Jim Crow... Well, what you see is from? that the name Jim Crow is attached to a performer. Oh. And you see the performers uh, coming together and actually, I mean, it's, it's derogatory to Crow, the whole thing, uh, blacks... But what's really telling, I think, is, and most important, is the notion of, and you see this later with D.W. Griffith in Birth of a Nation, black people being put down as murderers, rapists, ignorant, lazy, all the rest, all the kinds of negative stereotypes. And the whole minstrel attitude that's reflected in Jim Crow, again, is to demonstrate that you mock black people. It's, you know, Jim Crow is a white man in black face, dancing Jim Crow. Mm. TV had a powerful impact on the movement. Do you think that we could have achieved the success we did without TV coverage? No. Uh, you know, TV was in its infancy in the 1950s. Right. You're just starting to get things like Huntley Brinkley. Uh, you're starting, it was originally, you know, 15 minutes was the nightly national news. Um, and without a doubt, the civil rights movement, the fact that Brown had happened in 54, uh, led to a change in terms of the news media's treatment of civil rights. Previously, it was the black press that was covering the civil rights movement in this country. And as I, by the way, as I was doing Eyes on the Prize, I owe such a debt to the high quality, and I think sometimes people don't know this, high quality reportage available in the black American press of that period. But what happens is then all of a sudden after Brown and massive resistance, uh, which has started, you know, in terms of the southern states to try to halt uh, the advance of school integration, you see the major newspapers, the New York Times, Washington Post, begin to cover this, and with the nightly news coming into its own, they begin to cover the drama, the violence, the heroes, mm -hmm. the villains of the civil rights era. And what it does is it takes that story 
away from being a secretive event, something that was done in the shadows and shines a light on it and brings it into America's living room in a way that I think made it a challenge to conscience. There was no longer a way to ignore it or say it's something going on across town or way down south or somebody has an attitude. No, all of a sudden this was America as America was seeing itself. A mirror was being held up to an America in a way that had never been held up before. And I think it definitely helped to, well, I'd say it didn't, it wasn't a necessary ingredient, but it was a catalyst at that moment, especially in terms of the political process in advancing the movement. The mission of Eyes on the Prize was in part to encourage a national dialogue on crucial social issues. Your latest book, Enough, The Phony Leaders, Dead End Movements, and Cultural Failure That Are Undermining Black America and What We Can Do About It. What a title. That book, your book, Enough, is a blunt and compelling challenge, not only to all Americans, but especially to black Americans. Have we taken our eyes off the prize? I think so, Valerie. I think that it's so upsetting to me, uh, given the fact that I wrote Eyes on the Prize, you know, that, you know, Henry Hampton, uh, who I still consider such a hero to me, that, you know, Henry's vision, you know, didn't include the Sammy Davis dancing craziness of, that, you know, ABC wanted to commercialize. He had this vision. And I think when you look at where we are today with the civil rights movement and the ongoing movement in America, you'd have to say that somehow there has been a loss of focus in that sense, taking your eyes off the prize. When you look at the fact that we have 25 percent of African Americans still living in poverty today, and we don't have a major program, a major movement to address that, I think that there is a loss of focus. When you look at 50 percent of our children, black children, dropping out of high school in 2006, at a time when there's global economic competition, when there are requirements for a high level of education, way beyond high school, if you truly hope to compete, not only to get a job, but to hold a job, to pay for health insurance, to pay for higher education for your children, to pay rent or a mortgage, and these young people want to drop out of high school, you must understand something has gone way off track here. When you stop and look at the incarceration rate, now almost 50 percent black people in terms of the jails and prisons in America, you say, oh my gosh, you just want to hold your head. What is going on? Remember, Bill Cosby famously gave a speech on the 50th anniversary of Brown versus Board of Education in Washington, D.C. at Constitution Hall. In the midst of people who were clad in tuxedos and gowns, Cosby was invited, I think, just to be Cliff Huxtable, to be kind of a funny man, you know, the celebrity guest that night. Instead, he stood up and he started speaking about, for example, the acceptance of crime in the black community. Young people who go out and think nothing of stealing soda or a piece of pound cake, and then when they're caught, you know, their mom or not often enough, their dad wants to cry, oh my gosh, what's going on with my little boy? Cosby said, you know, where were you when he was two, when he was eight, when he was 18, when he got his first gun? Why didn't you know? Why weren't you involved in that child's life? This is no political prisoner. When you look at these basic statistics, indicators of social problems in the black community today, even as we have a larger and greater black middle class than ever before, you'd have to say there's been a shifting of direction and passion about making progress in the community. And you have to say that the lines of alliances, the appeal to conscience across the, the lines that would divide us, again, has been lost. And so this book, Enough, is, an, is, is a call to arms to all of us, black, white, rich, poor, liberal, conservative, to say we've got to do something about this. Critics charge that Bill Cosby was beating up on poor black people. But you say that his remarks were aimed at a different group in today's uh, black community. Who was he targeting then? Oh, I think without a doubt he's targeting people who are leaders, uh, people who have the ability to stand up and say something and try to make a difference. I don't think he was blaming the victim. It, it got even worse than that. People said that he was part of a new black bourgeoisie that was ashamed of the black poor in the country, Valerie, uh, that he was somehow giving ammunition to the far right, to the demagogues on the far right, that he was a simple-minded comedian. He didn't understand the persistence of racism, especially institutional racism, as a weight on poor black people in the country. 
Um, they went on to criticize him as someone who always played middle class black characters on TV, not only Cliff Huxtable, but if you go back to uh, I, I Spy and all that. I mean, it became absolutely like a personal attack. And of course, they didn't advance the conversation that Cosby had started. Nobody said, you know what, let's give him a platform, let's help him. And so that's why I decided the the vehemence of the attacks suggested to me there were people who were invested in the status quo as opposed to truly being concerned about the poverty, the out-of-wedlock births, 70%. Out of unbelievable. People not genuinely concerned about that dropout rate. I think that's the business of this generation. That's the business of people who are keeping their eyes on the prize as we begin this 21st century. You know, Du Bois gave a speech, I believe, in, two, in 1903 in which he said the issue for the 20th century was the issue of the color line, breaking down legal segregation, the story in eyes on the prize. I believe people will look back at Cosby's speech in 2004 and say Cosby gave a speech that set the template, the agenda, for the civil rights movement of the 21st century, a movement that had to deal with class issues, poverty, and education to make sure that people didn't get left behind in such a deep hole, as we see an increasing class divide in American society, that people don't get left behind to the point where they simply repeat generation by generation dysfunctional behavior, poverty, and distress, but that people are given the opportunity to rise up and help themselves. You said that Cosby was really talking to the leadership, the black leadership in this country. I really need for you to define that term for me, black leadership, because it's, it's such an ambiguous, I think, term today. So define it for me, please, and, and then we can talk about that. That's, That's a great question, Valerie, because I think when you look across the American landscape of leadership, if I asked you, who was the most trusted American leader without regard to race, mm -hmm. people would say Colin Powell. But ironically, oftentimes you would say people would, would respond, well, but he's not really a black leader, right? And yeah, they'd say, oh, yeah, you know, yeah. he's a Republican. We don't agree with some of his politics either. And then you stop and you think, well, okay, so what are we talking about? Well, you could think about Barack Obama. You say, well, he's a leader, but oh, he's a political leader, not really a civil rights leader. Well, what about Dick Parsons, head of the biggest communications company in America, Time Warner? Well, he's a business leader. What about uh, Stanley O'Neill at Merrill Lynch? Oh, well, he's, he's in the financial industries. What about Oprah? Oh, well, she's a media personality. Uh, we could go on like this. There's black leadership across the nation today in ways that would have been unthinkable a generation ago. But what we're really talking about is leadership that gives voice, represents those who are caught in poverty today, those who are weighed down by disadvantage in 2006, those who are seeking someone to represent their interest and make their voice heard in the American discussion. So why is there a void? Why don't we have voices that are doing that? I think we have voices that claim to be doing that, and I think in many cases we have graying revolutionaries who are still holding on to power who said they marched with Dr. King, they did this and that, but they're not ready to pass the torch. They're not allowing a new generation to emerge to address new issues. And too often I think there are also political alliances formed from way back, and the movement has evolved. I think the, the, the idealistic movement that was once in place has become more political and it's become a matter of big city political machines and relationships, alliances with unions and people who give money to political campaigns and even for some it's a matter of it's our turn in the way that it was once the turn of the Italians or the turn of the Irish or the Jews. Oh, it's our turn now to claim those contracts and patronage and jobs and I think that's undercut a lot of the attraction of an ongoing civil rights movement. And then you get people who say, well, you know what, wait for your next Martin Luther King Jr., wait for your next charismatic leader, wait for your next social program, vote for me, I'll deliver for you. But somehow that's not happening and we still have these persistent problems that need to be addressed and require the attention of a new generation of leadership. Okay, part of the gap is because because now those bright minds are no longer just being focused into civil rights, but they're going into business, they're going into entertainment, they're going into uh, whatever. So then 
What's what are the what are the current leaders doing wrong then? Uh, you mean you mentioned several things in the book, starting with not telling the truth. I don't think they're telling the truth is right, but I think if you look at some things that are going on, uh, you know, not to pick on people, but just to cite the facts. You look at something like Jesse Jackson, who was complaining about the incredible amount of advertising for alcohol directed at poor black people about things like 40-ounce containers mm -hmm. and high-content alcohol, malt liquor, all that. And then all of a sudden, the Bud's a Dud campaign goes away, and his son has a Budweiser distributorship in Chicago. You start to think about, well, wait a minute now, who's being represented here? Or you look at Al Sharpton. And you think about, wait a second, I just saw a commercial for Al Sharpton, his, his voice, his face is being used to get people into high interest rate loans, poor black people. And you say, well, why would Al Sharpton do that? Or why would Al Sharpton take money to stage a phony demonstration for one white corporation that wants to embarrass another white corporation? All of this done by people who would claim the legacy of those who marched, made sacrifices, stood up to Bull Connor's dogs and fire hoses to serve principle, not to serve their wallets. I find that so upsetting. I think it's a, a tragic turn to a grand movement. And yet those people are the ones who command the microphones, command the television cameras. Reporters tend to have very limited Rolodexes when something happens. That's who they call. Yeah. Jesse when, Jackson is the, you know, the black president. Right. Uh, uh, no, what is, what is it? So he was labeled as the president of black America or something like that. Yeah. So they call Jesse if they ever want to know anything. And I, I think at some point then it becomes a small race industry hmm. as opposed to a movement that invites the energies, the attentions of us all. And then if you challenge any of those folks, they say, well, why are you challenging black leadership? There's such a history of people trying to undermine black leadership. Oh, you must be a bad person. You must be like the J. Edgar Hoover who was going after Dr. King's sex life. Rather than to say, you know what, it's so much an imperative that we hold leadership in any field accountable. What are you doing to help those that you supposedly represent? You might be able to get a TV camera if there's some incident of police brutality, but there's an ongoing tragedy here with this dropout rate with the, what's going on inside the black family with so many children being born out of wedlock. There's an ongoing crisis here in terms of acceptance of crime and drug use and young people not believing they have a future. Where are the voices that are raised against the culture that would say to my boys when they're watching TV, well, in order to be a real black man, you've got to essentially fulfill some kind of mandingo stereotype. You've got to be, have a gun, some bling. You've got to act like you're ready for violence ready to throw down, you know, short-term thinking, short-term gratifications. If you're not killing somebody, you're ready to have sex with them and throw them away, not engage in any kind of loving act. The women are only invited into your world if they're dressed like strippers or they're sex toys. Where is someone to stand and say, you know what, this is not only wrong on a moral basis, it is defeating our young people. It's giving them a sense that they have no opportunity to rise up and to really make their mark in America. We see immigrants coming to this country for economic opportunity, for educational opportunity, and yet we have our young people who are not being told, you can make it in America. To me, this is a sin of our times. Well, your critics would say that there are all, that there are many, many reasons why that goes on. Uh, systemized racism, institutionalized racism. The, uh, and you talk about the victim mentality, uh, which, which the critics claim is uh, that that's the way we have to do it, and that's the way we have to survive. But talk for a minute about what you see uh, this victim mentality doing to the community. Well, I think that it's such a shock if you look back at the history of black leadership in this country, that the focus is always on overcoming, that we shall overcome. The focus is on opportunity. I could go back as far as Crispus Attucks, the Revolutionary War, Denmark, VC people who were leading slave rebellions. But you start, in my mind, with someone like a Frederick Douglass, who of course values education to the point that he, because education is being denied to slaves as a tool of oppression, 
has to learn how to read, to write, and the secret goes on to value education, to become an editor, to put pressure on President Lincoln to insist that black people be allowed to wear the blue uniform of the Union Army to fight for their own freedom on the idea that having fought and died for their own freedom, no one could deny equality of opportunity, privilege, every right and privilege accorded to any American citizen then to black people who are free in America. You think about Booker T. Washington insisting on creating mobile schools, schools on wheels, wagon wheels, buying land, creating educational institutions to educate young black people, an emphasis on keeping family together, building wealth. You think about Du Bois and his emphasis on educating the talented tenth with educating a leadership cadre that again can empower black people to move forward and a belief in self-determination, uplift, reaching inside ourselves to take advantage of opportunities that are presented. You come to Dr. King who said the best thing about the civil rights movement was that black people stood up tall, built coalitions, strategized. He said a man can't ride your back unless your back is bent and here were black people standing tall. And yet, in this generation, all we hear is, well, you're a victim, you know, don't worry about it. It's a result of racism, and you can't battle racism. It's so much larger than you, and you can't expect that people would be held accountable for their behavior or for battling against the kind of corruption of the popular culture. Well, that's just what's out there, and who's to blame? And don't blame the artist who's putting it out there. There must be some rich white man somewhere who's profiting up. There's always an excuse, a rationalization, not to have people take responsibility for their actions, what they're saying, what they're doing, in terms of helping to promote uplift in the black community. I'm sure that there are many out there who are trying to take that responsibility. Uh, when I knew that I was going to be talking to you, I talked with some people who worked with uh, young black, especially young black men in the prison system and, and whatnot, and, and I said, what are these young men saying? What are they feeling? You know, why do they feel so disinherited? And I was told that not only was there no hope there, but there was no one there to encourage them. There was no educational system there that was geared to them. There was no one to give them a break if they needed a job and if they had been arrested for a misdemeanor, you know, was nobody out there would give them a job. So there, there are many things that they have no control over and, and this is once again what your critics are saying, there are many things that they have no control over. So what do you say to a young man then, especially when there are things like unfair media coverage, uh, when all we're seeing is, is the negative side of being a black man? And I, and I must bring it up here. I must mention that even in, in your book, I saw a little bit of that unbalanced media coverage because there, when you talk about some of the black mayors in the past, you talked about in two sentences, you listed Tom Bradley of L.A., Harold Washington of Chicago, David Dings of New York, and Maynard Jackson of Atlanta. In two sentences, you, you went through their whole, their whole um tenure, so to speak, in terms of efforts to open doors for blacks and to participate in the economy. Then you went into two black mayors who were embarrassments for about five pages. So we had two sentences on the good mayors, five pages on two black mayors. Now, aren't you, aren't you perpetuating that same negative stereotype? No. Why not? <laughs> Well, I just wanted to let you get it out. I, 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 but, you know, I, let me start with the first part of the question about the young men, you know, that somehow they're not responsible. Why are they not responsible? You know, Bill Cosby says they can build all the jails you want, but you don't have to go. And, I mean, that's an important point. Why are they not responsible? You say they commit some misdemeanor. I mean, it's like the argument about, you know, oh, gosh, look at the penalty for powdered cocaine versus the penalty for crack, crack cocaine, isn't there a racial disparity since poor black people use crack and rich lawyers are using the powdered cocaine? Why isn't somebody saying, hey, wait a second, don't use cocaine. If you're a poor black man, especially, don't get involved with crack. Look at what it does to you, what it does to your family. Look at what it does to your neighborhood. I mean, it leads to crackheads mugging you on the street. It undermines retail businesses in the neighborhood, drives them away. Crack houses that 
devastate the real estate market in neighborhoods. Look at that. And why isn't anyone saying we should march against these drug dealers who are killing each other? I come from Washington, D.C. We have a crime emergency right now. The police chief has to try to put in a curfew to try to control it. I was in Philadelphia the other day. They've got a body count because there's so much murder. This is black on black murder, Valerie. It's black people killing black people. So you say to me, oh, poor young black man. Look, racism is a fact in American life to this day. I expect it to be a fact in American life. I say this as a pessimist on this front to the day I die. But you know what? You can't focus on that and say, well, that's an excuse for me not to take action, not to be held accountable for my behavior and what I do for myself and my family and my community. To me, that's a cop-out. And I think too many people are using it as a cop-out, especially in this generation. If I look back a generation to the heroes of Eyes on the Prize, I see people who had less opportunity, who had less in the way of financial resources, less in the way of political power, and didn't make excuses and got something very real and important done. And yet you want people to say, oh, well, that poor boy, give him an excuse, make excuses. Too often mothers and fathers, if the father's even around, are making excuses rather than holding that young person to a high level of expectation. You asked about the mayors, including your former husband, who I've said no, it very... he's still my husband. Well... <laughs> he's the former mayor. A former mayor. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> it's too much, Valerie. I, I, <laughs> your fantasy life, I don't know. Well, anyway, <laughs> um, I think it was very important to understand the point that was made about people who made such a contribution in terms of economic empowerment, in terms of uplift, in terms of what I described to you earlier as that evolution of the civil rights movement into political process and political power in a positive way. But here's the reality. The reality is that when you get people who, in my mind, are preying on the poor in order to get elected, and here I'm talking about people like Marion Barry in Washington, a man who was, as you well know, videotape smoking crack, it's not only that he got off in terms of the court system, it's that he then gets reelected. That really is a shock to the system. I'm talking about people like Sharp James. I'm talking about people who invite corruption into the House and all the while say they're doing so representing poor black people. To me, again, this is hypocrisy. This is truly selling out the legacy of the movement. And that's why I, in this book, Enough, I wanted to call attention to phony leaders. I wanted to call them out. You know, there's a such, it's almost a, an intimidation factor at work in our community. Don't speak these things publicly. We're all talking about it privately, but why you got to call it publicly? And the fear is, as you heard in, in, when people were attacking Cosby, oh, you're going to give the right wing or the, the bigot the opportunity to say, you know what, they don't have any more responsibility in terms of white guilt, that they are suddenly free from their responsibility for the terrible history, the terrible weight of racism, slavery, legal segregation in this country. And therefore, don't talk about it because you're, you're giving them a, a, a get-out-of-jail-free card. In my estimation, it's time now to say enough, to say we don't care about the bigots. They were never on our side anyway. They were never acting in our best interest. They were trying to do more to my daddy than they are to me. But it's time for us to stand tall and look at ourselves and say, what can we do to help ourselves and to have real discussion that will lead to real leadership and the people being held accountable and to real change? Well, if you've just joined us, I'm Valerie Jackson, and I'm going between the lines with Juan Williams. His latest book is titled Enough, The Phony Leaders, Data and Movement, and Culture of Failure That Are Undermining Black America and What We Can Do About It. One of the most controversial ideas in, it, in Black America Day, one of the most controversial ideas in Black America Today is that about reparations. Why are you so against reparations? Valerie, it's a matter of a waste of time. We've got so much to do. And yet you have people who invest so much energy and attention on what I consider to be a dead-end idea, a dead-end movement. You go on college campuses, they've got speakers, they've got panels, symposium being held on reparations. Let's look at the facts. John Conyers, the congressman from Michigan, since the late 1980s, 
has been simply trying to get the U.S. Congress to do a study of reparations. He hasn't had any success to this day. Let's look at the fact. The most liberal courts in this country have said there is no basis for awarding reparations. They've said the statute of limitations has long ago expired. There are no more slave masters, and in addition to which, at the time, slavery was a legal practice in the country. But there are no more slave masters, and there are no more living victims of slavery, no more former slaves. Then you say, well, but people make interesting arguments about people who are heirs and heiresses to former slaves, people who have been impacted by the horrors of slavery. But here's the thing, Valerie. We have such a country today of so many people from so many places. We have even instances in this country of black people who own slaves. This idea has no grip. If you, in fact, what's really telling to me is if you ask black people, African Americans, 50% of them say they want no part of reparations. And yet you wouldn't know that from the way that this thing is discussed and treated by some of our most talented, gifted black leaders. You're talking about people from the late Johnny Cochran, Willie Gary, the famous lawyer down in Florida, Charles Ogletree, the Harvard Law Professor, all these people investing time and energy and going after reparations. The reality is too often that what you see is small town hustlers going to people and again poor black people preying on them, telling, telling them they're owed reparations in their next tax payment and if you give me $50 I'll tell you how to fill out your tax form and they're going on taking money from people and of course it's all a charade. It's all a game. That's what reparations has become. And, but the principal sin in my mind is it's a waste of time, a waste of energy, when we have so many more big items to deal with. We've spoken about poverty, we've spoken about the problems of school, the problem of the family. You say, though, that the real price uh, of receiving reparations, though, would be that it would then remove all the moral responsibility from whites to then help continue to help blacks. Well, that's the other side of the argument. You know, you, you run into people, uh, the conservative columnist, my friend Charles Krauthammer, is a big supporter. You know why? Because he says, go ahead, take the check. I don't care what the check is for, because that's it. In terms of the U.S. government's social responsibility, the idea of everything from urban development to affirmative action, forget about it. Don't want to hear about it again. So I think it's along the lines of there's no free lunch. I believe, I mean, the last line of the subtitle of this book is what we can do about it. I believe this is an American problem. I believe that we have to deal with these issues in such a way as an American family. And yet there are people who would, I think, sell this out cheaply. And part of that is reparations. I think it's so short-sighted and, again, part of a defeatist victim mentality being advanced in the minds, and sadly, of poor, the poorest, most vulnerable black people. I wonder what it would be like if we took that energy and put it into education. Hey, I'm with you. Let's talk about the goal of education. Um, the, the, the statistics in the book amazed me, although I'm not really surprised. Let's talk a little bit about the time that black students spend studying versus other groups, for instance? Well, if you look at it, according to the statistics, if you look at the amount of study done by whites and Asians, it's almost double what black students do in terms of studying, hitting the books. On the other hand, if you look at time spent watching TV, it's the black kids almost double. Three times. Three times, so okay, three times what the white kids, the Asian kids are doing. When you ask about who has jobs after school because they want to get the latest clothes, the latest looks, all that. Again, black kids tend to dominate. You say to yourself, well, why is this? And so when you get an achievement gap between outcomes on a racial basis, white kids, black kids, you say, well, why is this? And what is going on in the system? Is this the evidence, again, of the face of racism in America? But too often, it's simply that if you took away the color and said, well, who's studying more than, and who's studying less, who's spending time on the kind of experiences that would enrich them, by that I mean 
you know, getting out into the world, understanding the political process, going to visit cultural institutions, things that would enrich them. You say, well, it's this group, and of course they're going to have a higher record of achievement in an academic setting. Not to mention, we come back to the victim mentality, that if you're in the classroom and you are striving to achieve academic excellence and your peers are saying to you negative things about the fact that you're trying to be an outstanding scholar, you know, the whole business about mm -hmm. you're acting white, you're trying to be better than somebody, that's going to have negative impact as well. So what you get is, this is, comes back to this cultural failure. You get a culture that says, oh, if you end up in jail, that's a rite of passage now for young black men. And why not wear your pants hanging off your butt and your, why not wear your pants without a belt because, you know, that's jailhouse fashion. Why not wear uh, your shoes without laces in it because you're not allowed laces in jail. That's jailhouse fashion. Why not wear a rag on your head walking around all day because that's what we do in jail. We don't have a comb. We're trying to hold our hair together. That, to my mind, again, contributes to the idea you don't have a future. You can't make it by educating yourself, by striving for excellence, falling down, standing up, trying again, which is, to my mind, the American experience, regardless of race. But we're saying to young black people, no, you can't do it. Instead, you've got to fit that minstrel show image that we see on the comedians. Either you're you know, like Dave Chappelle walking around using the N-word and cursing and all that, and mocking black people, I think it got to his conscience why he couldn't even accept the $50 million after a point. Or you could be one of these gangster rappers, and we're, you know, where is Tupac? You know, Boogie Small, these guys are dead in jail, come on. You know, or you can be one of these athletes who tries to glorify the gangster rappers and the minstrels. Let's talk about that a minute, the, this whole hip hop movement, which you uh, attribute to part of that culture of failure. Um, the, the irony, though, is that 80% of this hip-hop music is bought by young white, usually white boys. Males. Yeah, males, thank you. 80% um, of it. So why don't we see a similar pattern of negative impact on the young white boys that we're seeing on the young black boys? You know, it reminds me, this question reminds me, someone said to me, uh, Paris Hilton makes pornographic videos, acts like a fool in public, and she's doing great, and yet you want to hold young black women to a different standard. And I said, uh, let's think about this for a second. Paris Hilton is an heiress. Pa uh, Paris Hilton isn't fighting to get out of poverty. Pa Paris Hilton has a whole different standard and a whole different social network and a whole different set of people who are there to support her and keep her percolating, you know, and, and succeeding. That kind of thing is not available to people who are caught in poverty and also have the added weight of race in America. And so if, when you think about the impact of hip hop, I think that it is extremely damaging in terms of promoting stereotypes in the white mind. You know, the whole thing about young black men especially as violent, oversexed, threatening, consume with materialism, lazy. I just, I, I find this stuff terrible. It's horrible that that, but the greatest damage, Valerie, the most pernicious aspect to me is what it says to young black people about themselves. Who we are, how we are authentically black. In other words, to be authentically black, you have to be like one of these people who are engaged in the violence, one of these gangster rappers. You have to dress in this way, you have to present in this way, which of course, just adds to your problems in the larger world. Who wants to hire someone who's behaving in this way, acting in this way? Who can rely on someone? What family structure is supported by that kind of behavior and action? So to me, young white people, without a doubt, they buy it as part of their rebellion, their inclination to demonstrate that they're wild and having a crazy time. But you know what? They then move on. They go through that period. They might enjoy it, but they move on. For young black people who are living in poverty and who see this as, well, that's what's being glorified, that must be the way out, that's who I am in American society, I think it is absolutely crippling. And it sends them a signal, a message that that is all they can hope for in terms of success. That they could never be Maynard Jackson, but they could be Tupac. To my mind, that is poisonous as a message, and too often now, just accepted as, of course, that's true. Well, it's not true. It's a damned lie. 
Okay, so what can we do about it? Cosby had some rather simplistic uh, answers, things like uh, be careful with sex, don't get married until uh, you graduate from school and get a job and um, things like that. But these are, they might be simple things that we think that everybody can do, yet in many instances they are not because young people don't even know some young people don't even know how to be a good parent, don't even know how to go back to school to get a GED. Uh, to paraphrase Maya Angelou, if they knew better, they would do better. So how do we reach out to these young people who've already developed bad habits? How do we communicate you know, to them? I mean, are we going to have to use music the way they got it in the first place? Do we go back now with different music to try to reach them? You know, where do we go? What can we do? Speak out, Valerie. Break the silence, end the silence, defy the intimidation. I think that this is a message, you know, the message at the end of the book is prescriptive. It says very clearly, you have to believe in self. Don't wait for the next charismatic leader. Don't wait for the next government program. Right now, here are steps you can take to help yourself. And the foremost among them is get a high school degree. Not a GED, but get yourself a high school degree. Secondly, after you get the high school degree, stay in the workforce. Don't fall for this game that somehow, oh, that's demeaning work. Uh, you're not getting paid enough. You can't, you know, make an impression on a young woman making that little bit of money. Stay in the workforce. Build a resume. Get the experience that will lead you then to, into a network of people who know about opportunities opening up and prepare you then to step through that door of opportunity and succeed. And then you also talked about not having a child out of wedlock but also not getting married until you're in your 20s and only then having a child because only then are you prepared to be a parent. And of course being a parent may be our most important job in life. Yes, yes. So to my mind, you say, well, it's rather simplistic, but guess what? There are lots of people who don't know it. And that leads to the second part of your question, how can we get people to know it? Well, to my mind, real leaders should be standing at Dr. King's mountaintop and shouting out this information. Don't wait for anybody else. Don't wait on the government, anybody. Don't wait on whites or anybody else to do for you what you can do for yourself. Get an education. Defy the status quo that would accept criminality or drug use. Defy those who would say, oh, go ahead, it's okay to have a baby out of wedlock. Understand exactly how you can help yourself. According to the government, if you take these few basic steps that we've been discussing, there's almost no chance that you live a day in poverty in this country. Well, we have a 25% poverty rate. If we could just knock down the poverty rate in half, I think that would be a triumph for our generation. Okay, I would have to say that young, uh, many young black men would not agree with you on that, that if they work hard, if they get an education, then they would never be in poverty. I don't, it's not a matter of agree or disagree. It's a statistical fact. Oh, okay, okay. In the souls of black folk, Du Bois said, while it is a great truth to say the Negro must strive and strive mightily to help himself, it is equally true that unless his striving be not simply seconded, but rather aroused and encouraged by the white majority, he cannot hope for great success. True. And remember when he's talking, again, he's talking at the start of the 20th century, one of the founders of the NAACP and the battle against lynching and legal segregation in America that leads up to the Great Brown decision, to the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65. That is a seconding coming from the larger culture, coming from white America, if you want to be pointed about it, and the white political structure, seconding the idea that this must be an improved level playing field, even as we have the persistence of racism and the caricatures and the negatives that we know exist today. But that was what Du Bois was calling for. Now it's about taking advantage of that higher level of opportunity value. And this is where we come into play of holding the mirror to ourselves, of holding ourselves accountable, of saying enough to this victim mentality and to this culture of failure, and communicating that very clearly to our young people. You have the talent. You have the brains. You have the ability to succeed in this country. I believe in you. You've got to believe in yourself, and you've got to take action to help yourself. 
you are the one who's going to make the difference. It's not the next Dr. King. The last line in your book reads, now it is up to poor people, to black people, to Americans who care about issues of race and poverty, to begin the most successful anti-poverty program in America history today, the riches of Cosby's gift and acting. Excuse me, let me read this over. Now it is up to poor people, to black people, to Americans who care about issues of race and poverty, to begin the most successful anti-poverty program in American history by accepting the riches of Cosby's gift and acting to make the poor powerful. Before you leave tonight, can you give me and give the to, to those of us listening one example of an immediate next step that each of us can do within the next 24 hours to empower the poor? Start talking about what people can do to empower themselves, to help themselves to escape poverty in this country. Start talking. Break this silence that exists. Well, you know what? These young people are victims. They can't help themselves. Stop making excuses. Start having real conversations about real steps that people can take for uplift. You know, after Katrina, what struck me was there was so much good news there. Good news in terms of you saw people with extended families, especially strong families, able to get help immediately. They didn't have to rely on anybody. This also struck me as good news. There were corporations that said, let's move you out. If you come to a different area of the country where there's more economic activity, we'll help you get jobs. I saw church groups. Churches were taking people in all around the country. I know Atlanta was a center of so much of that. Church groups were very active, even sending people to, Atlanta, to, to New Orleans to help out. You stop and you think about neighboring states, about major philanthropies, all got involved. But the idea was people who had resources acting, making decisions to help themselves, and people getting away from this idea of victimization but looking for real strategies. So it may be a case of dispersing areas of poverty in big cities, looking for mixed-use housing, mixed-income housing. It may be reaching out to people in terms of saying, you know what, scholarships ex exist. Job training programs exist. Take advantage of those opportunities. But break the silence and stop making the excuses. Engage in the conversations and treat poor people with respect of any color yes. that they can, in fact, have the power to help themselves. To me, if we begin those conversations, if we move away from the phony leaders, who I think oftentimes are holding on to this discussion as if they are the only ones who are allowed to speak, we will then be putting in place the start of this century's civil rights movement. And, as, and to paraphrase JFK, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for yourself. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Juan. Valerie, my pleasure to go outside the lines with you. Huh? <laughs> and remember, there's always more to learn when you go between the lines. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a powerful message from one powerful journalist and thinker here in the 21st century. We're so honored to have him with us tonight. We don't want to over abuse him. We're trying to let him sleep some. <laughs> we want to give you an opportunity to go out in the lobby area and if you are interested to get one or both of his books and have him sign it for you, but we would also like to offer you an opportunity. We'll try to keep it to, let's try to keep it to 10 or 15 minutes to be able to ask him any questions that you would like to have. We have two microphones on either aisle here, and the gentleman's already picked up on this, and you can go first and have the first question. We'll alternate from this side to this side, so if you will line up so that we can do this fairly expeditiously. Good evening. How are you doing? Um, is this on? 
I can hear you. Okay, my name is William Jelani Cobb, and I'm a history professor at Spelman College. Um, I'd like to start by saying I appreciate your, what seems to be a sincere interest in the plight of poor black people in this country. There are a number, a huge number of things you said that are very inaccurate. Um, as a social scientist, I think what fatally flaws your argument is that you fail to distinguish between catharsis and analysis. Um, the problems that you talk about attributing to black people are fundamentally urban problems. We've known that. When you looked in the 1910s, the rates of poverty and crime among black Americans and Italian Americans relatively similar. You look by 1940, the Italian American rates have dropped through the floor. The black rates remain consistent. What's happened is that there are a number of different opportunities economically that open up for Italian Americans. The same thing happens um, with FHA loans after World War II, as well as the GI Bill and so on. Um, in addition, you kind of glibly pass over a few rather substantial issues, especially relating to criminal justice. I just want to say as a personal point, I'm a black man with a PhD. I've never committed any crime, yet I've had police officers pull guns on me three times in my life. And so to say that racism is something that can be merely dismissed, it's a problem, get over it and move past it. Had that officer, had that white officer simply applied four pounds of pressure to that trigger, I wouldn't be here to talk about this now. Moreover, um, you make the point of dismissing reparations. The tobacco industry, people would have said the same thing about people suing the tobacco industry for the impact that they had in manipulating the amounts of nicotine and cigarettes, saying that it was a hopeless cause, but we see what happened when the tobacco industry lost that suit. Moreover, finally, I have to take issue with your dismissal of Charles Ogletree's efforts for reparations, because this is not abstract. He is dealing with the reparations efforts for African Americans in Tulsa, Oklahoma, who were the victims of the worst race riot, worst racial uh, violence in the history of this country, to say that these people, over 300 of whom, were killed by whites who were deputized by the city government of Tulsa, and that the black area of this city was bombed, the only American city that's been bombed prior to Wilson Good in, in Philadelphia. But to say that these people were bombed by whites who were deputized by state authority do not deserve some sort of recompense or their descendants deserve some sort of recompense, I think is, um, is just absolutely wrong. And final, finally, I think that the point um, you should bear in mind about the acting white idea, there's a political scientist by the name of William Darity who's actually researched that, that and found that it doesn't exist. So I just want, at the end of this, ask a question, what was your method of research in order to come up with this book? Because just on the face of it, it seems that it's merely about opinionizing and not about actual research and rigorous information. Well, I don't know if that's a catharsis or analysis. <laughs> But I'll go with catharsis and I'll let you have your moment. But the fact is that when you look at this situation as you've described it, and by the way, I never said that you shouldn't have a, uh, some kind of recompense for what took place in Tulsa, Oklahoma, talking about reparations as a much broader concept having to do with slavery, reparations for slavery. So again, I would hope that you had read the book carefully. Then that would allow you, I think, to properly critique the effort. But here's the thing, you come back to this idea that somehow the focus should be on the victim mentality. And that's exactly what this book is intended to puncture, to explode. If you look back as you were describing statistics for uh, what you described an urban problem with Italian, uh, statistics on Italian criminal behavior in early in the 20th century versus black criminal behavior again in an urban city. The police chief had to try to put in a curfew to try to control it. I was in Philadelphia the day they got a body count because there's so much murder. This is black on black murder battle. It's black people killing black people. So you tell me, oh, the poor young black guy. Look, racism is a fact in American life to this day. I expect it to be a fact in American life. I say this as a pessimist on this front. But the day I die. But you know what? You can't focus on that and say, well, that's an excuse for me not to take action and not to be held accountable for my behavior and what I do for myself and my family and my community. And to me, that's a cop-out. And I think too many people are using it as 